Welcome back to Power and Planet. Today, I want to talk about something that sounds obvious, but isn't. When we think about disasters, we think about insurance. If there's a risk, insure it. But here's the practical truth. You could insure yourself against many things, but not climate change. The costs of climate-related disasters are already staggering for some countries. Because we didn't cut harmful emissions, we now face climate shocks of escalating scale and frequency. And because we've not invested enough in resilience, those shocks are getting even more destructive. According to the Songwei Stern report of 2022, developing countries outside China, those countries least able to afford it, need collectively between 200 and 400 billion dollars a year to respond to the loss and damage from climate-related shocks and rising. Other studies since have reported similar numbers. To put that into perspective, all the aid in the world on everything, not just climate, or overseas development assistance, ODA as it's called, is less than $200 billion a year and falling. Take one recent example. The floods that hit southern Brazil in 2024 and in 2025. Together, they cost close to $30 billion, and that's just one country. When I worked in the Caribbean, insurance came up all the time. After every major hurricane, some donors would introduce us to insurers promising coverage for next time. In response, the Caribbean pioneered the first ever regional public insurance pool in 2007, CRIF, the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. I know it well. I once ran the Barbados insurance regulator and got involved in negotiating and paying the annual premiums for a bit. And before I returned to the Caribbean, I'd built a career in London on financial risk, developing risk tools which won some awards, contributing to banking and insurance reforms. And I've been on the boards of a few insurers. The point being, I've seen insurance from quite a few angles. And what I learned is this. Climate change is becoming an uninsurable risk because climate-related losses are becoming more certain, larger, and more frequent. Many risks are insurable, especially those that are large but uncertain in timing, infrequent, and stable in outlook. Like earthquakes or volcanic eruptions or, 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 or writing off your car if you're an above-average driver, as we all think we are. But insurance is not magic. There's no free lunch. It's statistics. If climate-related loss and damage is running at, say, $200 billion a year and rising, then annual insurance premiums to cover it would also have to be $200 billion a year and rising. Plus, the insurer's admin costs and profit. For the poorest climate-vulnerable countries that contributed little to the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that seems like victim pays just in installments. Insurance works best when disasters are rare and uncertain like a once-in-a-20-year write-off of your car. Then it makes sense to spread the cost over time. But climate disasters have become more certain and more frequent. The tail risks, those extreme rare events you can and should insure against, have moved to the center of the risk distribution, almost commonplace. Imagine paying annual car insurance if total write-offs happen not every 20 years, 
but every year. Your annual premium would be higher than the cost of the car, from much benefit to little benefit. The spreading power of insurance requires uncertainty to spread across other risks and infrequency to spread across time. Climate shocks no longer conform to that. Another important feature is that insurance is annually renewable. Insurers can consider the risks one year, market annual policies, collect premiums, and the following year, walk away, exactly when the insured are most vulnerable. And they've already started walking away from wildfire insurance in California, flood insurance in Florida. So even in the richest parts of the richest country where they have most to give up. The climate vulnerable have become like prospective private health insurance clients with a pre-existing medical condition. Unwanted. Insurers counter that they can provide insurance more cheaply through parametric insurance. That's where instead of coverage for all loss from any event, there's a fixed payout connected to a few predetermined events. Fixing the payout in this way and so limiting insurers' losses brings new investors into writing insurance, allowing for new insurance instruments like cat bonds. But for the insured, this only means that it's cheaper and more available by reducing the coverage against losses, other than the most extreme events. So, at its very best, it's a partial solution to the underlying problem of increasing losses. In the hope, perhaps, that it would mean less calls on them, some donors have suggested that they would pay the premiums of climate vulnerable countries if they got insurance. Some believe there's justice in this because some of the donors are more responsible for this car crash than some of the climate vulnerable countries. But as belts are being tightened everywhere, and none of these donors have introduced into their annual budgets a line for billions of dollars of insurance premiums for climate risks in other countries, this offer may be limited to a very small number of tiny countries. Another partial solution, then. So what about the rest? What's the global solution? Here's the good news. While insurance has no leverage, a dollar in only gets you less than a dollar out on average, resilience investment does. Research from the IDB in Peril and Promise published earlier this year and the report by the WRI also out this year shows that a dollar spent on resilient public infrastructure saves $10 in the future in avoided losses. If we invest now in flood defences, climate-smart agriculture, stronger schools and hospitals, we reduce common losses and push the big losses from disasters back into the tails of the distribution, back into the rare and uncertain zone where insurance makes sense again. Climate vulnerable countries need low-cost, long-term loans to fund investments that provide multi-year resilience, helping them to pay back the loans many times over with the avoided losses and savings. As a group, AAA-rated multilateral development banks, with the support of their shareholders, are best placed to deliver low-cost, long-term resilience investment loans that developing countries need. If shareholders were to complete the capital adequacy reforms to raise their lending headroom, approve better resilience loan instruments, and give resilience and adaptation even more priority than they do collectively on average. The IDB is targeting 50% of climate finance on resilience, up from 30%. That may seem low, but MDBs measure resilience in a particular way. Only the resilience part of a loan, not the whole loan, is counted. 
So if the difference in a resilient bridge over the earlier one is an extra 20% of the loan, only 20% of the loan is counted as resilience finance. There could be five times as many resilience loans as loans to reduce harmful emissions, say, but if the resilience part were only a fifth of those loans, the measure would say that resilience was only 50% of the multilateral development bank's climate-related finance. So 50% is not as easy to achieve as it may appear. Nevertheless, while multilateral development banks do not have the identical mandates, I encourage others to follow where it makes sense for them. We can't do development if countries are frequently whacked by a heavy disaster or face an existentialist threat, as some low-lying countries do. Of course, a major challenge is that while borrowing for resilience investments that generate savings greater than the original debt is the prudent thing to do, many climate-vulnerable countries are already up to their neck in debt. Partly because that's how they've been absorbing the loss and damage from climate disasters. That's why these resilience loans need to be low cost and repayments spread over as long a period as possible. Another instrument that could help fiscally constrained countries are debt for resilience swaps, where money for resilience investments is released without increasing debt. More about debt swaps in an upcoming podcast. Yet another instrument that provides critical amounts of cash and liquidity when a country needs it most are pause clauses in debt instruments, where interest and principal repayments are paused immediately after a natural disaster. This is an important instrument in the age of shocks. But it's another topic for another podcast. Multilateral development bank lending is driven by countries' demands. And countries also need to prioritize resilience. Development is a tough business, and long-term priorities can easily get overwhelmed by fighting the current fire. At COP in Belém, the IDB team of Maria Mateo Baganza hoped to show a loan program which includes building 55 heat-ready schools in the Amazon region using low-cost technologies like reflective paint, green shading, and remodeling airflow. These adaptations can lower temperatures in schools by up to 10 degrees, improving learning and students' futures by a multiple of the cost of the investment or even a hypothetical cash payout. We hope showing what is possible, practical, and impactful will encourage others to request similar resilience investments. Insurance has its place, an important one. We need insurers to stay in countries because banks and investors rely on them for so many other things. The whole economy does. And they could bring their expertise to help governments map out the public investments in infrastructure that allows them to stay in. Many insurers want to help where they can, but the bottom line is this. Climate change isn't another insurable event. It's a structural shift. A shift that has occurred and is still occurring. Greater certainty of rising losses more frequently. We can't pay our way out of this shift with higher premiums. We must build our way out of it with resilience. Thanks for listening. This has been Power and Planet. <laughs>